Uh, Rebecca Harvey uh, is Assistant Professor and Program Director of Marriage and Family Therapy. Uh, she is at Seton Hill University. Uh, in 2005, she co-authored the book Nurturing Queer Youth, Family Therapy Transformed. She was a founding group leader in what has become the Q Center at AIDS Community Resources in Syracuse, New York where she won numerous awards for her advocacy on behalf of LGBTQ youth and their families. Rebecca Harvey maintained the private practice as a family therapist, specializing in sexuality and, and is an AAMFT clinical member and approved supervisor. She's especially proud of her newest identity, being out as a mom. Thank you, I appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. Okay, welcome. Um, I'm really honored to be here today, and it's a pleasure. And I love going first. I will do my best to wake you up. I also am really enjoying the fact that I have a number of students in the first row, no doubt to torment me and heckle throughout the presentation. So just be careful I don't call on you. Um, okay, so, great. Cut. Audiovisual, great. Okay, so. I have some prepared remarks that um, I don't have a lot of time, so I want to sort of stay on task. So I'm going to kind of go back and forth from my prepared remarks to being a little bit more off the cuff. If we have some time at the end, I'd love to take questions. I'd be happy to do that. Um, so just a, a few things I want to highlight at the beginning. Um, I'll start with a few introductory remarks, set the stage, talk about some goals I have for my time today. Um, I'll talk about what I think gets in our way of creating affirming and um, inclusive environments, what gets in our way of creating what I think about as refuge for LGBTQ people. Um, and then I'll talk about some practical ideas at the end about how to accomplish this. Um, first, oh, and also there's some, I'm, I'm working with this West Co Pride project in um, Westmoreland County, and there's some yellow, there's supposed to be some green sheets or yellowish sheets. We're, we're doing some data collection about what's happening in the county. There's some really interesting um, movement about creating a, a more inclusive county for the uh, LGBTQ people, and we're trying to uh, basically find out more about who's doing what. And so if you have one of those, I'd love for if you fill it out. Okay, so first, <clears throat> I use the, uh, the word queer and the abbreviation LGBTQ and sometimes the phrase sexual minority interchangeably as umbrella terms to refer to gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, and questioning people. I understand that queer in particular is offensive to some people and I'm careful about how I use it. I don't use it when I work with youth generally. I refer to myself proudly as queer, and I mean no disrespect by it. I'm happy to talk more about that later if that's useful. Um, another thing is, as helping professions, I, I assume that you come today with a base of knowledge about what's going on in the world, and in particular about the difficulties that many LGBTQ people face in the world, uh, particularly for youth. This has been very high profile in the last couple of years. Elevated rates of suicidality, homelessness, dropout, addictions, harassment, violence. Um, these are important backdrops for my remarks today, but they're not the focus. Um, oops. So I also want to tell you a little bit about me and explain a little bit about family therapy and how being a family therapy affects what I'll say today. So I am a family therapist, a clinical supervisor, a professor of family therapy at Seton Hill. I specialize in sexuality issues in general and have postgraduate training as a sex therapist. I have a great deal of experience working with LGBTQ youth and their families. Um, I was once, a very, very long time ago, an LGBTQ youth myself. Um, that just seems so distant now, it's hard. Um, and so that experience really transformed me. And it was, um, I was made to go to uh, therapy as a child and my revenge was that I became a family therapist. Um, much to my mother's hilarity. Uh, but back when I decided to pursue a degree in family therapy, um, even I was a little unsure. Uh, you know, at about 26, when I had graduated my master's degree in social work, I was thinking, um, 
I really wanted to do it, but I was thinking, can a gay person even be a family therapist? Um, I, aren't I like threatening to marriages and families? I mean, this is sort of the mentality that was around me. And so I had this, um, oops, this, thank you. This was hanging up in my um, office a lot when I was trying to figure out whether I actually should become a marriage and family therapist. Um, I, I, I th imagine it was a bit akin to being an atheist in a seminary. Um, and for a while, it was pretty confusing to myself and to the people around me, I have to say. But there was lots of moments of uh, fun, too, and, and I think really good learning. And that was the, that's the most interesting thing to me about this kind of work, is that it's very sacred ground when sexuality, spirituality, mental health and wellness come together. Um, it, it's really, there's such great potential for growth <clears throat> and also great risk for hurt. Um, but suffice it to say, 15 years later, um, it's, things started to click and made sense, and I'm here to talk about it. So a lot of people confuse family therapy with other mental health professions like psychology, and of course, there can be much overlap. However, however family therapists tend to focus less on individual behavior and more on relationship dynamics. Whether we are working with a couple or parents and a child or an individual, we are primarily interested in the often complicated way that people are influenced by the systems around them. And it's a misnomer to think of family therapists as only working with couples or only working with uh, parents and children. We work, uh, we work with, we certainly do all that, but we also do a great deal of work with individuals. Um, and we're thinking about relationships all the time. So as a family therapist, I'm interested in the kinds of relational or systemic elements that interfere with mental health and what relational elements uh, promote it, acceptance and inclusion being primary examples of that. Uh, I think it's also important to note that all this systems thinking does not mean that I do not believe in the power of individuals. I do believe in this. In fact, I have found that individuals often can act more powerfully and effectively when they are clear about how they are being influenced and pushed and pulled by their relationships and how they're being influenced by the expectations of people that they love and respect. In, in fact, I found that people often surprise themselves and can act much more powerfully than then even they imagined um, when they are clear about how they are being influenced and when they're clear about how their actions can be healing to the people around them. Uh, I say all of this to you today. Um, can you advance it one more? Thanks. I say all this to you today because one of my main goals is to convince you that you're important, um, vital really to the creation of affirming and inclusive environments for LGBTQ people in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, not just for the people themselves, but for their loved ones. You are vital and uniquely important, no matter who you are, or what you do, or where you live, or work, or what church you attend, or do not attend, or who you vote for. You matter and your actions matter. Uh, my second goal today is to dispel the us versus them kind of mentality that can be so destructive when it comes to divisive topics like LGBTQ sexual identities. There's a lot of discussion and a lot of focus on the things that separate people. Um, and I'm interested in those. They're, I think they're in, they're, they are interesting and important discussions. But I also want us to not forget that there are many things we could agree on. And the us versus them mentality um, is not helpful to, the, to that kind of progress. Um, number three, another goal I'd like, to pra I'd, like, uh, I'd like to do today is to practice with you holding complexity. I'm going to ask you today to resist the urge to oversimplify these very complicated issues. In my experience, when people are anxious or uncomfortable, they often rush to oversimplify. They rush to judgment. They go for quick fixes, which in the end are neither quick nor effective fixes. I will ask you instead, as I am consistently asking my students, to their horror and exhaustion, um, to practice to allow yourself simply to notice. <clears throat> I will ask you to notice the things that make you anxious. Notice the things that make you worried. Notice today uh, what happens when you get uncomfortable and to just sit there with it. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, could you advance to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so 
these are two true quotes about, this is again, a lot of my stuff comes from LGBTQ, the work I do with LGBTQ youth. So the, I'll just read this, the empirical documentation is of one accord. The rate of suicide among gay, male, bisexual, and lesbian youth is considerably higher than it is for heterosexual youth. The high risk among lesbian, bisexual, and gay male youth to suicidal ideation, attempts, and completions had been brought to the attention of psychiatrists, social workers, health educators, and therapists, and others. Unfortunately and tragically, few have listened. That, that is still true. That was, that was written in 1994. That is still true today, as I think the last couple years have spoken loudly about with the rash of suicides that were very high profile. But it is also true that sexual minority youth are fabulously successful navigating the terrain of their sexuality and becoming healthy, well-functioning adults. This resilience, a necessary adaption to living in heterocentric and homonegative environments, is generally not recognized in the popular media and clinical literature, which tend to emphasize the doom and gloom of gay youths. This clinicalization of sexual minority youth does great disservice to their accomplishments. And so what I'm suggesting today is that we hold on to both of those things as equally true. Um, I think we are right to be worried about LGD, LGBTQ people and in particular youth, but it is a disservice to them to be organized by this worry. If we rush to uh, fix this, to see only what is, to see only their limitations and their vulnerabilities, we easily lose sight of the ways they survive and thrive and transcend every day. And it would be easy to treat them as if they have no internal wisdom, as they have no gifts to give us. And that would be a, that would be a mistake. And in my experience, these youth have a great deal to offer. And, not, and they have a great deal of gifts to offer, not despite their LGBTQ identities, but because of these identities. And this is a really important point, because in my work in the last seven years, I've met a lot of kids and parents and people who, loved ones of LGBTQ people and the LGBTQ people themselves who think they are deserving and loving despite their identities. And this makes me sad, because I, I realize in my own life that the gifts that I have cannot be separated out from my own LGBTQ identity. Um, these are part and parcel of who I am. Not all of who I am, certainly, but, but, but a part of it. Um, so, as I continue today, I'd like you to just hold this complexity. Expect that as we talk, you may get anxious. Uh, you may feel judgmental. You may worry that you're incompetent. And you may want to go to fix this neatly or quickly with something you're to solve. Um, well, well, you know, this whole th it makes me laugh because I sort of think, well, welcome to my world because I consistently feel incompetent and anxious and judgmental. Um, and this is to be expected when you do this kind of work. Um, and so instead of doing any of that, I just want you to notice it. What makes you uncomfortable? What makes you nervous? Just notice and sit with it. Um, and as I said, we do this all the time in our training program because I want our clinicians to not intervene from this place of anxiousness, to not speak from this place of worry and incompetent, their fear of their incompetence and the judgmentalness, but to hold a, a minute and to figure out how, what they really want to do, what they really want to say, and to speak from that more calm place. Um, can you click it in the next one? Thank you. And finally, number four is ultimately my hope today is that I might say something to inspire you to act, something to inspire you to do something to create a more inclusive and accepting world. I would like you to be clear about simple and pragmatic things that you can actually do when you leave the room, today or tomorrow when you wake up or next week when you return to work. And this, I, I want to own, this is not entirely altruistic on my part. I selfishly want a more inclusive, accepting, kinder world for myself, uh, for my child, for my loved ones, um, and for my students and for all of you in the room, because it is my belief as a family therapist that what affects one will affect all. Okay, next slide. So. Uh, let's practice holding complexity. Am, are, you woke, are you awake now? <laughs> you will be soon. Okay, so uh, I, would like to I would like to talk a little bit about what I think gets in the way and interrupts the development of uh, creating these inclusive environments. I have noticed in my own work with LGBTQ people, uh, some, particularly youth, but not always just youth, 
um, that LGBTQ people often profoundly confuse and challenge the people around them, which disrupts the, those people's ability to nurture them. Um, LG, LGBTQ <laughs> sexual minority youth are, pr are, are exploring previously uncharted territory. We, they are coming out younger and younger. LGBTQ people are coming out it, the, the research is of one accord about this, that, the, that LGBTQ youth come out much younger in this generation than in previous generations. They're uh, de developing more fluid, complicated gender and sexual identities than ever before. Identities which openly challenge the very way we have constructed uh, romantic relationships. And this can be very disconcerting to the people around them. I marvel at the ability of some of the people I have worked with to risk everything, to stubbornly fight for the space in between. They stretch the boundaries of gender, exchanging the relative safety and security of labels like man, woman, gay, straight, masculine, feminine, for the freedom of the space in between these labels. They are less and less interested in having society name them or having their anatomy define them. In a world where many genders are possible, just think about that, in a world where many genders are possible, words like heterosexual, gay, lesbian, bisexual are becoming anachronisms, something that increasingly belongs to a previous age. These youth, they have five o'clock shadows with French manicures. They sport buzz cuts and tank tops while going braless. They are guys who look like girls who are attracted to guys that look like women, or women who look like guys who fall in love with women who are femme, or butch, or both, or neither. They are trans F to M or M to F who often pass as regular men and women until they don't. Or they are masculine young men who romantically desire the masculinity in others and feminine women who are sexually attracted to the feminine in men or women or both or neither. Confused yet? Because <laughs> I am. <laughs> they don't feel safe. They don't have it all neatly figured out. They are complicated and they are changing and they need to know they're not alone. They do not want to have to pick a team. Instead, they are creating themselves as they go, defining and redefining their gender and sexual identities out of their clothes, their hair, their ever-changing desires, their mistakes. They are openly wrestling with the meaning of their lives while simultaneously trying to figure out which bathroom they should use in the mall and how to handle the reactions of those they will encounter there. And they need our help anticipating and handling these reactions. They are fearful and fearless, fighting for respect, needing help to connect to their own wisdom. They are sometimes dangerous in their own self-destructive behavior. They are also yearning for connection and for validation, angry but still hopeful to be cared about, withdrawn but still yearning to make their loved ones proud. They don't want it all neatly laid out for them but we sense their pain and their yearning, and we have, we have to fight our own urge to be angry with them for not fitting in better. And they are sometimes punished for not fitting in, punished for being seen by the wrong person at the wrong time. And this is how they come to us in our schools, in our offices, in our homes, making us now wrestle with some very difficult, very interesting, and provocative questions. The flamboyantly gay young man who wields his sexuality like a weapon at school, his flamboyance makes everyone uncomfortable and they keep trying to get him to tone it down. They cannot see his flamboyance as a measure of his resilience, that he is no longer running and hiding. He, is, he knows who he is and he is no longer a victim. And his effeminate voice and his walk and his fabulous hair might make us wonder what exactly we relinquished when we forged our own identities as men and women. There is the M to F trans youth who says to me, I just wanna make my man breakfast in the morning and greet him at the door at night when he comes home and rub his neck and get his slippers. And suddenly I am caught, the long suffering feminist in me wanting her to see this as problematic, yet knowing how badly she wants me to see her 
and knowing that to do so, I might have to rethink how I have balanced submission and domination in my own life. LGBTQ people can sometimes crash hard into our, our own disavowed parts with their complicated, confusing experiences. They pose dangerous, provocative questions, questions we assumed we were supposed to have long ago answered, and so we did, forging identities as men, women, gay, bisexual, straight. I was listening to a family therapist. Her name's Esther Perel. If you get a chance to check out her work, I, I would recommend it. She was speaking recently, and I was very provoked by what she was talking about. And I believe her work is talking about this very same thing. And she spoke about how most of us adults have an inherent dilemma that we desire, on the one hand, security, and on the other hand, excitement. We want stability, and we want hot sex until we're in our 80s hopefully. <laughs> um, and the way we have resolved this dilemma as adults often involves disavowing something of vibrant and necessary, something threatening about our own identities. We define ourselves right out of the space in between, in between lover and spouse, in between male and female, in between gay and straight, in between something known and stable and something unknown and exciting. In th it is in this space that so many LGBTQ youth and I think adults inhabit and are attempting to struggle. The very same thing that Perel sees is blocking long-term eroticism. Her work is in working with long-term couples about how to, st how to stay erotically connected and also committed. Um, it, it, this, the same thing in her work that blocks this, I see is interrupting our ability to affirm and include LGBTQ people in our community because it is hard to affirm in others what one is actively disavowing in oneself. Can you hit the next slide, please? So I want to talk about what, in my work, I call creating refuge. And, and th this is what I'm saying, that to create refuge, we have to first understand what we have tried to disavow. Um, and that to create refuge is to create a healing space um, a container that makes room for increasing complexity, that we can, we can hold the beauty of these LGBTQ identities along with the things that we're worried about. That's not to clean it up. That's not to, to say that it's not, that there aren't things, especially for me, that LGBTQ youth do that terrify me, because there are, they do, they do frequently terrify me. But some of it, some of it is, uh, I, or, or I can't let that piece of it blind me from the things that are also beautiful about them. And so within this kind of a refuge, par participants can t continue to see the best in human beings while acknowledging our differences and our blind spots. Um, and I want this more for the LGBTQ community in this region. Um, I worry that LGBTQ people are exploring these kind of treacherous waters without enough support from families, from communities, and from their, their society. I worry that they are more isolated than they need to be, and that the messages they receive are, are the messages that they receive are either punishing or and judgmental, or they are silent. Just they they hear silence. People who are loving and caring and who could be accepting and respectful sometimes don't know what to say, don't know how to say it perfectly, so they don't say it. And when this happens, we miss really important opportunities to be a part of the creation of a refuge. When we don't say it, what the LGBT community is left with is the negative messages and the negative experiences, the gay bashing, the being called faggot on the street, um, the being sexually harassed. Um, they experience that, um, and they experience the judgment, and they experience the awkward silences, and they need something louder than that. They need something else besides that. Um, I think they deserve that. Um, and so, and also, my other point that I've been talking about is, is that if, despite our own worries and despite our own concerns, we could nurture them, that they might alter us, that they might also teach us something that's necessary and precious. Um, could you hit the next slide? Oh, there we go. Which leads me to you today. Um, Kathy Weingarten is a family therapist out of Boston. 
um, who teaches at Harvard, and someone who I really respect. And she wrote, hope is something we do with others. Hope is too important. Its effect on body and soul too significant to be left to individuals alone. Hope must be the responsibility of the community. Um, and this is again where I am appealing to you um, that, that this is all of our responsibility. It doesn't matter if you don't think you know someone who's LGBTQ. Um, first of all, I, I doubt that's true, um, but it, 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 it's a, a community responsibility. And I moved here seven years ago, and uh, time does fly. And when I, 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 when I first moved here, I experienced some major culture shock. I felt very often like a bull in a china shop as I tried to get acclimated. Um, God only knows the people I offended or the miscommunications that happened. I'm, I hesitate to even guess at that. Um, but what has occurred, you know, I stayed, and people stayed connected to me, and I have just met amazing people here, um, people who are smart, who know an awful lot, who are caring, engaged, um, many people who care about LGBTQ people and their loved ones. And this is a really important point, that inclusion and acceptance are good for entire communities, not just one segment of a community. When you affirm and include one person, there is a ripple effect that goes well beyond them. LGBTQ people, it is not us and them. LGBTQ people are solidly entrenched in the middle of this community, of this region, of families, in schools. Um, we have parents, we have siblings, we have grandparents and children, partners, nieces and nephews, friends and colleagues like you that care about us, are hurt when we're hurt, are frightened when we're frightened. For every gay kid being tortured at school, there are three kids watching, worrying they will be next, and noticing how the adults around them intervene or fail to intervene. Not to mention that there are the child's parents who are worried and wondering who to talk to, who will support them, who is safe to talk to, where do they turn for solace, where do, they, where do their churches stand, with them, against them, for every LGBTQ parent who's worried about job discrimination, there's a child or children similarly, similarly affected. And this is why you are each important, because you each have unique spheres of influence. You work different places, you live in different communities, you go to different churches, people in places that only you can reach. Um, you probably don't even know all of the people that you could touch once you start trying to talk and ask questions about what's going on in the LGBTQ community. Could you hit the next slide? Thanks. And this is the challenge part of my, um, I always try to be nice and then I try to challenge a little. So that was the be nice part before, but <laughs> that wasn't clear. <laughs> um, so the challenge thing is, comes from a, a, a theorist who I read and have enjoyed her work a lot. There are many people, and I think probably many of you, in the, in the worlds that we inhabit who have a strong interest in the dignified treatment of any gay people who may happen to already exist. But the number of persons or institutions by whom the existence of gay people is treated as a precious desideratum, a needed condition of life, is small. So perhaps many of you, like Sedgwick is saying, believe in being respectful and accepting. And for those of you who do, what I'm asking you now is can you move beyond this respectful acceptance to a place of treating sexual minority people as precious, as necessary? What would you be doing differently if you started to think this way? And I guess I also want to acknowledge that there may be those of you in the room, many times I, I talk with people in, in this category, who may be because of religious belief um, the most you can do is to be respectful. Um, we do not, and, and I think you're as needed and as valuable. We do not have to agree on everything for us to agree on some things. And to you, I would say, you're just as necessary to this process. You do not need to agree with me on everything I've said or on, on anything I believe to intervene when you hear some young kid being called a faggot within your earshot. Um, just as I do not have to um, be a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew to intervene when someone is hurtful or dehumanizing to someone else in my presence um, because they are a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew. 
A few years ago, there was a student in our program who, was, who identified as a fundamentalist Christian. She and I disagreed about a lot. We did. <laughs> but we respected each other, and we came to care about each other. And at one point, she asked me if I would come to speak with her pastor about uh, LGBTQ people. I agreed that I would, but I asked her, you know, why don't you do it? Um, right. <laughs> Please. Uh, no, I mean, I, I said I would, but, but my point was this. Um, she spoke his language. She could affect him in ways that I never could. Um, and this is really another main point I've been trying to make. Um, and this is why each of you are so important. We, because of these fears of influence, there are people who simply cannot hear or see me. I don't know if you've, I'm sure you've had this experience. You walk into a room and there are some people who simply do not hear you. Whether for me, this happens sometimes because I'm out, people cannot, because I walk into a room, they know I'm gay, they don't listen. They stop, they stop hearing me. But this is, I'm sure happens to everybody. This happens because uh, you're a woman or it happens because you're too young or it happens because you're too old or it happens because you don't, you're not dressed right, or you don't have the right qualifications, or whatever it is. You have that experience where people just can't hear you. But what if you had like a bunch of people that had your back, that the person who wasn't hearing you could hear? And, and that is what I'm suggesting. Um, so this young woman and I were talking, and I was, saying, I was saying and challenging her, don't put this on me only. I will come with you, I will do this with you, but this is also your um, opportunity and responsibility and something only you can do. So, um, can you go hit the next slide? So I'm going to end my remarks today um, with a request. Um, oh, next one? Did that? Yeah. Um, and it's a really simple request. I just want you to do something. Um, to try something. Western Pennsylvania, this region, needs you. And the very simplest thing I could think to, to, to tell you to do is to just start asking questions. Um, and I, I've been working with this West Coe County Pride Project to just try to ask really simple questions of the people that we know. Um, and I've included some of those here. Does my workplace, workplace have a non-discrimination policy um, that includes sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression? Um, who are the doctors, the therapists, the lawyers, the professionals in the community who are safe for LGBTQ people? I think it's really interesting to just start asking um, sexual minority people what it's like to live here and to not be satisfied with the, I certainly do not represent all LGBTQ people in this, in this region. We all have really different experiences. There are some similarities and there are some differences. But I would, I would recommend asking some people um, what is it like to be a trans person facing an inpatient stay? Are there policies and procedures in place to handle this kind of thing? This has come up a lot in residential treatment facilities in the region. Um, I get calls about this every once in a while. Um, and I think it's a really important thing for us as helping professionals to, to wrestle with. What are the kinds of questions we ask? I know even for doctors, you, um, I'm frequently asked when I go into doctors questions that don't apply to me. Um, Finally, you know, this, the church, the religious connection is a really tender one and, a, and a, a difficult, tenuous one, but I think a really important one. Um, there's a place called the Family Acceptance Project out in San, in San Francisco, and their research is working with youth and families, and what they're finding is that the single most protective factor for youth are their family's response. If a family can be supportive, it protects kids from the elevated risks of homelessness and suicidality and uh, drug addiction. And so what they're, the message that they are trying to get out and that I am trying to get out when I work with people is you don't have to promote uh, you know, a sexuality, homosexuality. You don't have to uh, religiously believe in it. Um, to love your kid, to tell your child that you, to, that you care about him or her. Um, you, people, and I think there are people on both sides of the aisle get caught up in this. There are some GLBTQ activists who think the only acceptable way to support your kid is to be totally accepting. And, you know, I understand where that comes from, and I also think it's um, 
short-sighted and not true based on what the research at this Family Acceptance Project is saying. That small change can be very important to, especially when youth are going through these sort of difficult transitions in their teenage years. Um, so I, I think involving churches and helping people imagine as a Christian, what is it that I want to do? What is it that I want to say? How is it that I want to be? Um, you know, what, how, what could I do or say in this moment? So I, I've talked a lot, I've been doing a lot more work in, with regard to uh, religious belief in churches because I think this is so vital for, as a support system for families as they are going through with their, their uh, loved ones what's happening. Um, so I've talked a lot. Um, I don't know if I have time or if there's questions I'd be happy to take. Yeah, so the question was, um, this woman was saying that her, is it your, mo your mother you said? Is, is wondering about how to tell her friends about her grandson who is transgendered. Is that right? Um, you know, I think this is difficult to answer without knowing more details about the friends. And the, you know, one thing I, when I talk with people about um, coming out, which is indeed what I think this is, this is a coming out process for your mom, um, is that you want to understand. The, so how I, this, is, this might tell you a little too much about me too, but I'm always thinking about you know, what's the worst case? Um, and helping them figure out the pros and cons to doing, to, to doing the telling. And there often can be very good pros. Being seen and known and having people support you is a really important mental health consideration. Um, and to also be able to deal with what happens if it doesn't go well. And the other thing I'm always, tell, again, always telling my students is to talk about what it is you need from, so I would ask her to think what she'd like to say, what she wants them to know about her, about her grandchild, um, about not just the trans things, but, you know, that he likes baloney or, you know, that he likes fashion or whatever it is, you know, that there's a, there's a, a totality that gets missed, a wholeness that gets missed that I would, I would encourage. And then to be able to ask them for what she needs, to be able to say, I just want you to hear me out here, or I need you to, now I need you to say something kind. <laughs> something that simple will help people around you be supportive. So I would, I would start there, I guess. Sherry. Sure. So um, we have been doing a lot of stuff in the county in the last year. There is a, there's kind of this groundswell of really interesting things happening, and I would love for people to be involved with them. We're always looking for more and more people. So um, as Sherry was saying, we, we've been doing a, a number of things. Um, there has been the, an interfaith, an LGBTQ interfaith collective, which is basically a, a group of um, interfaith people who are interested in caring spiritually for the LGBTQ community, um, their loved ones and themselves. Um, that's happening in Westmoreland County, and they are meeting regularly. Their uh, P flag developed recently, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. They meet on the first Sunday of the month, I believe. Um, and that's, that's been a really big, I think, important project. Um, I've been, uh, Sherry and I both run the Westmoreland County Pride Project, which is a group of uh, basically community people, um, people from agencies, clinicians, um, all sorts of different kinds of people who are interested in simply creating a more inclusive and affirming uh, co uh, community and to affirm LGBTQ people and their allies. And we're sort of figuring, we're trying to figure out how to do, we might be doing a Halloween party, don't quote me on that. Um, but just some of it's just fun. And um, some of, we're also trying to start a, a basically a countywide uh, gay straight alliance because there is no GSA in the local school districts. And as somebody who works with youth, I cannot say how, I've been saying this for a bunch of years now, but I can't tell you how important it is to have um, a group for kids who are, so that they are not so isolated. And there is not an up and running GSA in the county in any of the local schools. So we're trying to do a, a county-wide one. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, please, um, on those forms, ha yeah, there's an e put your email address and I will get in contact with you. You can also contact me through Seton Hill's website if you have a question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a community affairs director for WPXI-TV Channel 11 in Pittsburgh. I got an interesting email this week from a viewer. He was listening to our disclaimer, which comes on, you may periodically have heard it, saying Channel 11 does not discriminate against race, sex, age. 
he says, that's nice, folks. But unless you specifically are trying to hide something about LGBTQ, you might get sued. So you might want to think about changing that. Mm -hmm. So I wrote, copied it to my general manager. He's in contact with the lawyers now. Mm -hmm. Our thinking is the FCC says we're okay with that language. Do you think it should be changed? So this, yes, <laughs> I do. <laughs> but let me just say that I'm so bad. So we're, sometimes when we're sitting in these meetings with, uh, with the West Coast Pride Project, people are saying, people will say to me, stop being so touchy-feely, tell people they'll get sued, and then they will change, right? So I think that there's a certain segment of the population that needs to hear, you will be sued if this doesn't happen. And I think that that, you know, that could de indeed happen. I, that's not really my specialty. My specialty is in inspiring people to act in their own self-interest. Um, and I, my point today is that this kind of inclusion and acceptance is not just in the interest of the LGBTQ community, but in all of our self-interest. So I would say, yes, do it. If, you know, if some people need to do it because they get sued, otherwise, fine. I think it's just better. It's just you lose talented people when you don't protect them. Uh, and, and that's the argument for these non-discrimination policies, that if people do not feel like you care about them, if, like, like you are acknowledging their existence, they will go elsewhere, and you lose talented people that way. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>